today. This is the uh, day of the birthday of the church. It was the day in which the disciples gathered together in the upper room in Jerusalem. Once again, Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem. And unlike me, they were patient. And uh, all sorts of things occurred. And it's funny, the best line of the whole Pentecost story is, as the disciples and everybody are getting all rowdy and out of hand, somebody looked and says, they must be what? Drunk. Isn't that hilarious? Not us United Methodists. Nobody will ever accuses us of that, right? Right? Yeah. Please fill out your registration forms and put those in the offering plate. Mike Engel, myself, and Mr. Freddie were in beautiful Peoria this last week for annual conference. It was an interesting time. I learned a lot of things. Um, and Mike and Dick will be coming to you in a week or two uh, between now and the end of, uh, of June to give you a report and let you know what happened at the uh, conference. So looking forward to that. Tiding is due tomorrow, so please get in your um, articles. Um, Sherry's going to be doing the tidings, so I've got to remember that because I just sent it to Thel, and it shouldn't go to Thel because Thel's still in Europe somewhere, wandering. So make sure that Sherry gets your articles, please. Turkey Hill Grange will be having a patriotic program this Friday night, um, which is Flag Day, the 14th, of course, at 7.30. All are invited to present, um, as they present three quilts of valor to three of our local veterans. The program begins at 7.30 and following the monthly regular Grange meeting, refreshments at the end. If you have any questions, you can talk to either Mary Beth Lee for details. And she's here, I know, so I said hi to her, wherever she's at, here in the group. There she is, waving her arm. And uh, let us uh, prepare ourselves now as we go to God in worship.
Would you please stand as you are able as we join together in our call to worship, which is in your bulletins. God comes into a world filled with uncertainties and darkness. God embraces the wounded and broken. God is the candle shining in the darkness of our days. God is the light of our lives. God is the one who makes all things new. Praise be to God, now and forevermore. Please remain standing, if you would, please, and join in our first hymn. It is on page 92, For the Beauty of the Earth. <laughs> Would you join me in our unison prayer? Eternal God, we thank you for calling us by name. In you we live and move and grow. We pray for churches and Christians throughout the world. Remind us of our common foundation in Christ. May we grow together in faith and love until we attain that unity which is your will. Send down your spirit so that we may know Jesus and bear witness to our life and unity in him. May we know the mind of Christ. 
in order to speak God's wisdom everywhere. Strengthen us to work towards peace and reconciliation in church and society. Build us together in Christ and make us your dwelling place. Amen. Please be seated and invite the young people to come up. Good morning. Come around here so I can see you. Everybody having a great week? Enjoying being out of school? Yeah. Driving your parents crazy yet? Yes, I have. <laughs> That's what I've been hearing. How many of you like to fly kites? What? It, it's really a lot of fun to fly kites, isn't it? How does the kite stay up there? Wind. The wind, isn't it? How many of you have ever seen the wind? That's a trick question, isn't it? You can't really see it, but you can, you can feel it, like you said. What are, what are some ways that you see the wind or, or feel the wind? And there's some ways you see the wind, but like when there, there's a storm coming in, like we've had a lot of storms lately and the trees are going back and forth. Um, so what about um, feeling like when you're outside playing, do you feel it on your face? Yeah, you feel it on your face? What about one of these? The pinwheel. But you don't see it, do you? You don't see the wind. So blow on the hand, back of your hand. Do you feel it? Feel, see it? No, but you could, you, couldn't, you could feel something, couldn't you? So today, many churches are celebrating a special day called Pentecost. And it was on the day of Pentecost that God sent his Holy Spirit to the church and on that day, the Holy Spirit gave the early churches gifts of forgiveness, truth, and new life. The Bible tells us that the apostles were gathered together when suddenly there was a sound, mighty rushing wind. Then it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and God's Holy Spirit is like the wind. We can't see him, but we know that he is there, right? We know that he's there with us. We can know the Holy Spirit is there because we can hear him. The Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him. We can't see the Holy Spirit, but we know he is there because he speaks to our hearts. Another way we know that the Holy Spirit is there is that we can see him moving pe people to do God's will. The Bible says that the Spirit of God moves his people to speak and do things for him. We can't see God but we can see people doing things that God's Holy Spirit has moved them to do. Just like this pinwheel. It takes us, me to blow on it because we can't see it. Just like we can't see the Holy Spirit, but we know, we know that it, it is with us. So I have a pinwheel for all of you. You want to take it? And I want you to remember that the Holy Spirit is with us. Everyone blow on it. I just want you to remember that he is with us, that the Holy Spirit is with us. Does Parker have one? Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit, even though we can't see him. We are thankful that we can hear him speak to our hearts and feel his presence in our daily lives and see him moving us to do your, your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to Junior Church.
Will Will Langston please come down from the balcony? Oh, he's got a long trek. <laughs> Just jump over the top, Will. <laughs> Why not? And Jordan just left. Well, Jordan's going to get recognized at the second service with you. Well, you may or may not. I don't know. Well, you... She was here and she left. I know. Because we told her she's getting recognized at the second service. She, she can come down if she'd like. She's shaking her head now. You can come down if you want Yeah, to. come on. You're standing out there talking. Get in here. Come on, Jordan. She's coming. Come on. We're going to make you do it twice. That's good. Well, congratulations on your graduations. And your, um, we, we know that, Will, you graduated from Belva West. And what are your plans for um, your future? I know you're going to Lindenwood St. Charles. What are you going to do? I'm playing baseball there, and I'm studying business. Good. Congratulations. He's a great baseball player, by the way. My son played against him, so I know. And Jordan graduated from Belleville East High School. And what are your plans? Um, right now I'm going with Coach Tiki, and I'm transferring to Olive City for elementary school. Good. Teachers, that's what we need. Yes, we, um, our church has a small gift for you, and we wish you all the best in your new adventure. And our prayers and blessings will be with you always, and God bless you. So for those that are here, Matt Hill, are you here? Nope, nope, nope. He's out uh, doing counterintelligence stuff. Alexis Basinger. <laughs> Lexi? Lexi's here. I know she's here. I saw her. Yep. And Sarah McVitie Taylor. Congratulations to all of you on your graduations, and your church family loves you and will be with you always. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. an impressive group of people. They did a lot of stuff. MS in education and college student personnel administration for MS. I don't, I'm going to ask you afterwards what that is, okay? We'll talk, okay. And now we have a doctor of optometry in our group too, so we all get free eye exams, right? <laughs> Kent, Sue, right? Would you join me as we go to God in prayer? Loving God, we are grateful for this day as we come before you to once again remind ourselves of our worth to you because of your love for us. You have loved us even before we even were, we were born. You loved us. Your names are written on your hand and in your heart. And we're grateful, O oh God, that you've called each of us to be a part of your family, brothers and sisters in Christ. As we come before you, O oh God, this morning, we ask that you would be with us as we are the church that you've called us to be. That we might continue to reach out to those in need around us. That we might continue to, to bring others in to share the good news about your son, Jesus Christ, and his life and death and resurrection. We pray for those this morning, O oh God, who are in need, those who are suffering, those who are ill, those who are undergoing treatments. We pray for your spirit upon them, that they might feel your touch and your comfort. We pray for your church, O oh God. We pray for her everywhere on this planet, wherever she's at this day. Those places that are difficult to be a church and be a Christian. We pray for those who are in need. But especially this morning, O oh God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to reign upon us. That like that first Pentecost Sunday, that we might also feel 
the movement of your Holy Spirit in our lives and in the work of this church. And that we might continue to reach out in love and care to this world. We thank you and praise you this day as we pray together the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. join me in prayer. God, we are grateful for all that you do for us, but especially we're grateful for our church. Work through her and through us to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Our ushers come for our offering.
Please remain standing for our middle hymn. It is on page 572, and it is Pass It On. Please be seated. I can't help but wonder if anybody else in the congregation sang that as part of a musical in high school. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> I remember it very well. We continue our study of the book of James today from chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, and 11 and 12 on the pages as printed in your bulletin. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
probably one of the worst church meetings I've ever been at. A few years ago, in one of the churches that I was serving, I won't say which one, on fear their anonymity needed to stay that way. But we had a conversation at a board meeting about, no, it wasn't the color of the carpeting. It was about church times. And the praise band leader of the church felt like we should flip-flop the church times. And so church was at 9 and 11, and there was a conversation about the fact that we should change those around, move the contemporary to earlier. He had studies, you know. If it wasn't for the fact that I am a halfway decent referee, I think it might have turned into a fist fight. I kid you not. It was the one of the most, there was animosity with everyone. It was terrible. He soon after that decided to leave the church and walked out on the praise band. Sometimes I think we idolize and, and, and idealize that, that early church. You know, we, we remember that day of Pentecost when the early church gathered together up in the, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they read that thousands of people started to go in the church. And, you know, and, and then we look at other churches around and we, we idolize them and we idealize them. We, we look and go, oh, I wish I was kind of like that church, you know. Pastors do it. I just spent three days with a bunch of them. I mean, there was a bunch of them there. Nothing like getting a bunch of pastors together. I love the lay people. They're fun. But all the pastors sit around talking about and, you know, and, and having conversations with one another in the hallway about how many people were coming to church or how much money they had or everything else. It's, it's that way every year. I'm used to it. I've been doing this for 30 years now. I, I get it. And before that, I was a preacher's kid. And so my dad would drag us to conference. Ooh, that's fun. I'm telling you. <laughs> so I've been doing this for a long time. We think that maybe that early church, that first century church, it was, it was dynamic and powerful. They had such sweet fellowship, you know. It's almost like it was like, ooh, how great they were. But the reality was, if you, if you read between the lines, the early church was made up of people, and people have not changed over centuries. Many, if not all, First century churches wrestled with conflicts between members. The Corinthian church was divided into factions. If you read through the church and the letter that Paul sent to them, it's, it's scathing about, he says, you know, you got one faction doing this and you have another faction doing that. Imagine that. The Philippian church had two women who couldn't get along. I don't know if it's in fact that they were two women, but just two people. And there was a conflict so severe enough that Paul singled out them by name in his letter to them. The Galatian believers were biting and devouring one another, it tells us in Galatians 5. Paul began a practical section of Ephesians on appeal to unity and tolerance and love between members in Ephesians 4. And then on a personal level, even Paul and Barnabas had serious disagreements that led to them parting their ways and going in different directions. So, you know, the church wasn't really always that great. And then James, dear James, comes to us this morning and he puts his finger on the problem with the early church. He says they've lost their way because of evil desires, in quotes. Now we should take note that the Greek word here is hedon. Yeah, hedonism. That's the word. From which we get this idea of hedonism. Today, I think, we kind of live in a kind of a hedonistic, hedonistic it's a hard word to say, age where our populace has run into pleasures and self-gratifications and desires and appetites and, pa and passions. But 
It was the same in James' time. This first verse in James that Betty just read to you points out that the reason for their fighting is because, here's the hard part, everyone was trying to get their own way. Imagine that. We just spent the last three months in the United Methodist Church where everybody wants to get their own way. It's the same now as it was in the early church. Maybe they even got together in Jerusalem and started fighting over the color of the carpeting. I'm not sure. But James warns us this morning that when we focus on ourselves and our wants and our desires to get our way, it can cause problems within the church, right? James wants us to know that when we begin to focus on the needs of others, we find that our needs are not as important, and we find a way to compromise and cooperate with others on mutual needs. There's a couple words that you don't hear much anymore. Compromise, cooperate. I feel like Mr. Rogers now. You know, that guy had a loud good theology, and he was actually an ordained pastor. I don't know if you know that or not. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 4. He says, I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. <laughs> Paul reminds us in Ephesians that this notion of unity reminds us that we are in this together. That we are one body in Christ. Paul goes on further and says that the, about the great diversity in the body. He says, you know, that there's many parts, each part doing its own for the good of the body. There's hands and feet and mouths, all moving in conjunction with the good of the body. We can do better as the church. We can. This church proves it every day that we are in existence. Carrie hit upon it last week in her sermon. She talked about the fact that this church and this community Union is known in Belleville and throughout the, in the area for being a church that gives. It's a church that offers things to others that are in need. It is always ready to do mission. It is always ready to love. It is always ready to reach out and love and care to others. That is not only a reputation of this church, but it is a part of our mission. It is a part of who Union is. And it's an honor for those of us who serve here to be a part of that. But James says that there needs to be a violent uprooting of our selfishness. We try to justify our role sometimes in our fights in terms of high ideals. You know, when you get into an argument with somebody, you know you're always right because you know, you know exactly what the truth is, right? You know exactly what things are and you know exactly that you are on the high road. And they, they don't know what they're talking about. You ever gotten that argument with somebody? Critical issues and injured rights are supposedly about defending. We are so right that we're just simply right. And James does not entertain that kind of talk, though. He drives right to the fact that fights are at the bottom, are about personal desires. And it all facts, falls back on this little word that all of us need to have with one another, and that is the word of grace. It's an easy word, and yet it's hard, to, it's hard to manage, isn't it? When we find ourselves able and willing to be humble and graceful, things that seem large and significant turn smaller and less daunting, and in the serious light of God's grace and love, Grace and forgiveness offer perspective. And the things that seem so large and loom so large in our lives become small 
and not as important. Did you ever notice that in your own life? When you decide to take on other people's you know, issues and you decide that you're going to be compassionate and empathetic and love other people, that the stuff in your life doesn't seem as important. And you, you kind of set those things to the side. Then you also learn, and I heard this this week a couple of times from people just around this church, that when you find out other people have more serious problems than you and you think to yourself, well, I could be worse off, couldn't I? Now, we are all passionate about certain things. I know that. James, I'm sure, was aware of that. But I also think that when we make a concerted and determined effort to center our lives and God's work in this world, all that stuff moves to the background and we begin to focus on Christ. Which is the reason we're here. It is when we say, Lord, do whatever it takes to bring our passions into full submission before you. Send your Holy Spirit as on that first day of Pentecost. To cleanse us from the inside out. Root out our love for this world and replace it with a permanent and, and fresh love for Jesus Christ. Then, when we do that, we will become the church. The conclusion for us is that in our fights, sometimes they reveal a wrong relationship with God that manifests themselves in things like our prayer life or our, our way that we lead our spiritual lives and live our lives out. Because either we don't pray or we begin to not trust in God's grace and his love for our lives. And then, and then, when we learn to follow Christ, then we will be the church. So on this Pentecost Sunday, I invite you to remind yourselves that we are the church. And that Christ has called us to be that to this world. Would you join me in prayer? Great and loving God, um... There are times when we just want to get our way. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. And we are certain of it. And yet, when we focus on you, everything else seems to peel away. And we are reminded that we are loved. And that we are called to love. Help us to be that kind of church, God. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing our last hymn together? It is on page 557. Best, best be, blessed be the tie that binds.
She even practiced at home with a Bible. How many of you practice at home with a Bible? <laughs> Aha. This is um, a uh, traditional Native American prayer, and it is a prayer to the Holy Spirit. It's in our hymnal. O great spirit whose breath gives life to the world and whose voice is heard in this soft breeze, we need your strength and wisdom. Call us to walk in beauty. Give us eyes to ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make us wise so that we may understand what you have taught us and help us to learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. Make us always ready to come to you with clean hands and steady eyes so when life fades like the fading sunset, our spirits may come to you without shame. Amen. Oh. 